right, welcome everybody to this episode of the Present Day Saint. I am joined again today by uh, Aaron Shafalahoff. How are you doing? Doing well. Did I, did I pronounce it right this time? <laughs> Shafalahoff. Shafalahoff. I think for the rest of our friendship, I'm always going to be worried that I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I take delight in every mispronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> So if you heard, uh, if you got a chance to listen to um, uh, the episode that we, we did last week, uh, Aaron was in a debate with, uh, with Latter-day Saint uh, Kwaku L a few weeks ago. And so what we're doing over uh, last week, this week, and the next week is just walking through that debate, uh, giving some context to it, and then letting Aaron, uh, you know, kind of debrief a little bit about the debate, uh, hitting on things that he didn't have time to go, go into during the, the short time period he had on each of these topics. Uh, so last week, we looked at the question, we did kind of a, you know, overview of, of the whole thing, and then looked at the question uh, of, from part one of the debate, which was, uh, what is salvation uh, by faith alone? And, uh, and so today, what we want to do is look at part two of the debate, which is the question, was there a great apostasy? So, uh, Aaron, do you want to um, maybe just kind of give an overview of w- when we say, was there a great apostasy? You know, what, what does that mean? What, did, what do the, uh, the LDS mean when they say that there was a great apostasy? And can you maybe just give a little bit of a, an overview of this topic before we dive in? In early Mormonism there was a restorationist fervor to return Christianity back to its primitive roots. And in the earliest stages of Mormonism, this meant going back to the practice of the charismatic spiritual gifts, including visions and angelic visitations and tongues and the spirit of prophecy. So Smith really tapped into this angst and claimed to be a prophet, claimed to have the spirit of revelation. But as Mormonism progressed, as it evolved, it transformed to be about something called priesthood authority. So in the mid-1830s, the narrative shifted to be that an ordained priesthood authority was necessary for the administration of the ordinances essential to the church and that the priesthood authority to do so was lost. And so Smith retrofits uh, a a story about the restoration of such priesthood authority. So if you look at the Book of Mormon, the great apostasy isn't about the loss of priesthood authority. It's really about the corruption of the land, the loss of Christianity uh, in general. And uh, later on, we get more priesthood authority loss. So if I could set it up this way, there's a thick and a thin definition of uh, the great apostasy. The thick definition is that there were no more, uh, there was no more church, no more kingdom on the earth. It was completely obliterated. And uh, Joseph Smith is told, for example, in the first vision account, as it's at least recorded in 1838, Uh, God tells him, quote, I answered that I must join none of them, the churches, for they were all wrong. And the personage who addressed me said all their creeds were an abomination in his sight and those professors, that those professors were corrupt. So there's this deep sense of moral corruption, uh, doctrinal corruption. Uh, The idea is that uh, early Christians were not able to continue Christianity because of, of of ethical issues. The thin or the minimalist definition that's more popular today among some Mormons is that uh, the early Christians were well-meaning and simply because of the logistical problems introduced by persecution, uh, they were unable, the the apostles were unable to form a quorum to properly pass down the priesthood authority of the church. But so the idea for some, you know, so the idea would be that back, back in the first century, uh, the early church was practicing what we see today in modern Mormonism and that because of the death of the apostles and in some different things we can get into that was lost to history for uh, what, 1800 years. Is it, I mean, is that what would they claim that in the first century they were doing baptisms for the dead. They were doing all the temple ordinances. They were doing all the things that they're doing now. They at least say some of those ordinances were being practiced in the first century and that at least the priesthood authority uh, 
was being exercised and that the reason we don't see it in scripture, the extant scripture, is that the scriptures were fundamentally and fatally corrupted such that the essence of New Testament Christianity was lost. And, and this is where we can get into, which we won't today, but we get into New Testament textual criticism to, to determine if that's true. And if you're listening um, we'll, on, on future episodes of you know, this show, and I think we've maybe even touched on it in the past, we'll, we'll certainly talk about that and um, talk about why we can actually trust the New Testament. But um, would you, so priesthood authority, okay? So you mentioned that, I'm, in, uh, maybe, I'm interested in two things that you, you hit on there in this opening, priesthood authority. So what is the what is the idea um, in regards to uh, priesthood authority that that only those who have sort of been pa- so Jesus passed it on to Peter and then Peter passed it on kind of like the Catholic Church is that kind of priesthood authority that so that only those who have that authority passed on by a, a rightful person can um, can do the ordinances which would I guess would include baptism and um, into the Melchizedek and Aaronic priesthood those kind of things is that kind of the gist of what they're saying. Yes, uh, I would kick it up a notch just to put it in grand perspective. Mormonism teaches that there is an eternal law or an eternal priesthood that is the standard to which all the gods much ad- must adhere to. They, all the gods are obligated to conform to this priesthood authority, eternal law standard. And so God is able to function as God because he has tapped into the priesthood authority, uh, the priesthood power that he has uh, received, that he has been ordained with, that he's bequeathed with. And so the purpose of life uh, is for God to help other spirit children become gods through this spirit, through this uh, patriarchal priesthood system. And that, that is downstream here to the church. So yeah, they, they would, they would claim the categories of Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood so much so that uh, Joseph Smith changes, a, I think it's verse 3 of Hebrews chapter 7, um, whereas the author of Hebrews sees Jesus as, as he's, he's a Melchizedek as a type uh, of Christ to come, and Christ himself fulfills that type. Uh, whereas Joseph Smith, uh, he changes the verse to say, all those who are, or, who are ordained at, in the manner thereof. Uh, so yeah, the, he, he sees the Aaronic priesthood as continued, which is fascinating because Hebrews 7 builds its own its entire argument on the uh uh the inadequacy of the Aaronic priesthood the obsolescence of the Aaronic priesthood how it, Hebrews 7 even argues from the premise that Jesus couldn't have been an Aaronic priest because he wasn't of the same he wasn't of the proper tribe to be that kind of priest so I, I ask uh, Mormons on the street was Jesus of the Aaronic priesthood and uh two-thirds of them will say yeah um even though he was another right tribe, but yeah, they, they they've reconfigured those categories to be modern church categories for their for their men. Uh, yeah, and where where do they? So you said that it's sort of like this eternal law. I know that when we get into sort of words like eternal and stuff have different definitions for Mormonism, but where does this eternal law come from? I mean, do they even do they even talk about that, or is that just deep theology that they they don't mention? Oh, I think that's a great question. Um, in fact, uh, Kwaku, who who I debated, which we're talking about here largely, uh, we had another dialogue on the street where he his premise was that there's only two categories of existence. There's material and there's ideas. And uh, he argued that God, if he wasn't material, then he could only be an idea. And so he argued that the evangelical God was a mere idea. But the irony is, Mormonism uh, doesn't attribute eternal law or priesthood power ultimately to a personal being. So uh, reality has this impersonal, abstract, without body parts or pa- body parts or passions, uh, abstract idea. It's part of the furniture of the universe. It, it's not attributed to anything ultimate. It, it's just passed down from generation to generation among the ancestry of the gods. And so it ends up being like a platonic form because every generation of the gods just so happens to implement this, you know, eternal standard. Uh, if there's anything if there's anything truly eternal in Mormonism, it's the eternal law. Uh, the eternal law has been around longer than God has been exalted as God. It precedes all the gods. It's co-eternal with uh, every existing being. So my, my yeah, sorry. 
it's just there. And I, it's odd. It, what's really interesting to me is that Mormonism accuses the God of classical Christianity. They would call it cl- creedal Christianity. They, they accuse the Nicene Creed as giving us a God that is without body parts or passions. And that has a rhetorical effect in Mormonism such that God is without any desire or relationship or personality or reality um, in, in the way they use those terms. And the, the irony is that eternal law ends up being the ultimate governing standard of their worldview. If you say that God is the ultimate, if you, def, if you say the category of God is the ultimate thing, the foundation, the ground of reality, the standard to which everything must conform, it, Mormonism's God in that sense is a law that isn't, uh, it, you know, it's not attributed, you can't attribute it to any ultimate deity. It's, it's, um, it's like a code without a programmer. It's like a law without a lawgiver, ultimately. So yeah, that, I, we've kind of, we've kind of uh, escalated the issue pretty quickly. Uh, but priesthood authority uh, really is situated in this Mormon worldview of a, of a universal cosmic system of authority and the way things work and the way patriarchal generations of the gods are set up. Um, and so they think that the church was set up to kind of be an implementation of a little, you know, microcosm of things that extend that, uh, that, that prep you, that prepare you for becoming a god. Uh, yeah. And, and so, all right, you said one other thing that I want to just hit on, then we'll dive into the to Quaku's opening statement. But you said that there was sort of that there was a an original sort of understanding and kind of uh, outworking of Mormonism, and then that change. And you said the original one was was more of uh, somewhat more. Um, I don't know. I guess you you know if you want to call it um, Pentecostal. charismatic, Pentecostal, yeah. charismatic. Uh, we just speak. We speak a little bit more about that. So there was this. So you there was a change within within Mormonism into kind of what it was and what it was originally, and then what it is now. So if you took Joseph Smith, um, if, he, if you had gone back into time and taken him back to the future, to 2020, he would have been mortified at modern Mormonism. Joseph Smith saw uh, the, the loss of the vibrant practice of the charismatic spiritual gifts as a key evidence of the great apostasy. So overly institutionalizing everything um, is a no-no. Overly, you know... Uh, putting a heavy weight that stops people from being able to practice these spiritual gifts in a vibrant way was a big no-no. So, you know, the early Mormons, they, they spoke in tongues. Um, they went on about visions. Uh, they uh, were pretty excited. And uh, if you go to a modern service today, it's nothing like that. It's, it's, uh, it's I mean... They claim that they practice the spiritual gifts, but they've basically, it's turned into something that's more I- institutionalized. Yeah, yeah, but early Mormonism was basically upset that the spiritual gifts had ceased to practice. So tongues were a part of that. That's interesting. Because, yeah, because, I mean, my understanding, it came out of essentially that time period of the Second Great Awakening and the just sort of awakening of um, more of that, you know, emotional preaching emotion emotionalism which obviously is is rampant within within mormonism but that makes that makes sense that that's that that would be the appeal back then and it is interesting that now it's become a lot like i mean in many ways but i mean it's different but in many ways it's come become a lot like sort of like the catholic church which is there you know a lot of that they were kind of uh, appalled at at the er, in the early stages of of mormonism Mm mm-hmm yeah, that's interesting. So, all right. Well, um, okay. So let's uh, let's dive in then uh, with that sort of as a background uh, of the great apostasy. So the question is that was up for debate is was there a great apostasy? Uh, Quaku would say there was. Uh, Aaron, you would say that there wasn't, and we'll get into that here in a minute. So, so Quaku uh, opening statement, um, and uh, well, maybe I don't know. Do you have any? Uh, so hopefully, again, people will have watched the, the at least this part of the debate, watched the whole debate before before they. Um, before they listen to this sort of breakdown of it, but any overall thoughts about his, uh, his opening statement, we kind of walk through, you know, piece by piece here in a second, but any overall thoughts about it? It was a lot like part one where, where we debated the thesis is salvation by faith alone 
in that he maybe supplied a few minutes of actual material, if that. Uh, I think he supplied two texts. One was from Acts, is it 20, where... Yeah, so he lightly touched on that, but almost to kind of cover his bases superficially and then move on to what he really wanted to talk about. So it was his job to affirm and demonstrate the thesis that there was a great apostasy, but I think he really wanted that part of the debate to be about whether or not um, he thought Protestantism had a sufficiently moral uh, heritage to be take seriously. Yeah, it was, I mean, again, like, I mean, if you listen to the first, uh, you know, our first episode of the breakdown, uh, ep, you know, part one was supposed to be on salvation by grace through faith alone. And it ended up being, a um, a diatribe against, um, predestination and certainly his, his understanding of, of that, which we would even, we, which we talked about, we disagree that that's even a correct, uh, understanding of predestination, but this one's same. Yeah. Like you said, same thing. It ended up being, um, he, he, he pivoted, he talked about, well, let's, let's, let's look at those first three things that he did mention kind of to make his case, then we kind of talk about where he pivoted again, attacking Protestantism and really reformed, um, you know, Calvinism and, you know, in Lutheranism. Um, but so Matthew 24, um, verses eight through 11, maybe I'll just read these and then let you comment on them. Uh, cause I think you, you know, you even mentioned some of uh, Matthew, uh, in your opening, um, statement, but, but basically he says, so he quoted this, um, uh, all these things, the beginning of sorrow. So he's talking about there'll be, there'll be nations, will rise up against nations, wars, and these kind of things. And he says, uh, Matthew uh, 24, verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness, lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Um, I, okay, what would you know that was so they, again these are his two proof texts which look at acts 22nd for the fact that there was a total great apostasy of which you know the kind that you outlined uh earlier what do you how would you respond with just that verse it's odd well it's strategic on his part that he did not continue the quote so the next two verses read but the one who endures to the end will be saved next verse and this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. So in the immediate context, Jesus is speaking about a tribulation through which true believers will endure. Uh, this isn't, uh, it's not enough to demonstrate that there is a falling away. Uh, if, if Mormons want to demonstrate a great apostasy, so, so um, Protestants believe there's been reoccurring apostasy for 2,000 years, uh, the, the difference is we don't believe in a great apostasy, which is defined as the obliteration of the kingdom of God, the complete remo removal of the church from the earth. Uh, so that's what he really needs to demonstrate here. What, he, what, what this passage only demonstrates, though, is that there is a tribulation. Uh, there were false teachers, false prophets. There was betrayal. Uh, there was hatred of believers. There was a growing cold, a lawlessness. But in Jesus's view, there are believers who endure to the end through this. Uh, and uh, if you if you attach this with the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus, uh, with a view to the evangelism in the very uh, last paragraph of Matthew 28, with a view to the evangelism of the entire uh, world, th to all the nations, making disciples, Jesus says, I will be with you till the end of the, uh, end of the age. And he says other things, which we will get to later in this talk, um, which show us that Jesus didn't see the kingdom as something that was going to be completely destroyed in need of a uh, restoration by a another head of a, another dispensation or uh, another messianic figure. Um, yeah, I mean that's an important that's an important part, right? Because if if there was no great apostasy, that there obviously there wouldn't be a need for a, a restored um, gospel. So there wouldn't be a need for the restored church. And so, for the, on their view, they have to have the great apostasy, but. It's like you just said, it seems like in Matthew 24, what we find out is there will, there will be false prophets. And I think all of us would say, yeah, we, we would nod enthusiastically and say, yes, keep reading. And yes, pay attention to these false prophets. We wouldn't want you to apostatize from 
true Christianity on account of such things. Right, exactly. So, okay. Um, so yeah, it doesn't seem like just, you know, it certainly is a proof text that that gets them where they need to go. Uh, and then, um, and then Kwaku, then he looked at a return to Acts 20 uh, verses 29 and 30. It says, for I know this, that after my departure, uh, this is Jesus talking. Um, Savage wolves will come in and among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. So the context for this is Paul is circling back to Jerusalem and he is just south of Ephesus, if I'm thinking correctly here. And he has the elders from Ephesus travel down uh, and he does a rendezvous with them. And he pours out his heart to these elders, and he warns them of what's to come. So the, the obligation, the um, duty here of a Latter-day Saint, if they want to use this passage to support the great apostasy, is that they need to show that Paul is preparing these Ephesian elders for something that they won't endure. Uh, in other words, is Paul telling them, you're all going to die, you're all going to fall away, or you know, the Christianity that you're helping steward is, is going to be completely destroyed. Uh, you know, what, what does Paul mean here in Acts 20 that the, the, the flock will not be spared? Does he mean that the entire flock will be destroyed? Or does he mean something like he, mean, like this, he uses the same language in Romans 11, where he says God will not spare the natural branches or did not spare the natural branches or something like that. Um, and he Paul tells the Gentiles not to get too arrogant because, you know, neither would he spare the unnatural branches. Uh, But God did preserve natural branches. Uh, The language isn't used in Romans 11 uh, to imply the the entire obliteration of the kingdom of God or the church or uh, the complete absence of ethnic Jewish believers within Christianity. Um, Nor does it mean that here. In fact, if you read the rest of the New Testament, Paul writes letters to those in Ephesus uh, preparing them to endure through the uh, influence of false teachers. And he teaches, uh, he sets up a teaching for, this, for the shepherding of a people so that they would uh, endure through such a season, through such a hardship. So I asked Kwaku in the debate, is, pa- is Paul preparing the elders here to endure through hardship? Or is he just telling them that none of them are going to survive it? And the... Uh, the obvious answer is that he's preparing the elders to survive and to, with, to withstand such a, a hardship. And Kwaku pivoted very quickly. He, uh, um, and this was very disingenuous. He used this passage to support the great apostasy in his opening remarks. But when I confronted him on this in the cross-examination, he changed his position to mean that Paul perhaps didn't even know that there was a great apostasy forthcoming. That this, instead of demonstrating the great apostasy, this was just demonstrating the seedling, fledgling, incipient stages of apostasy in general, which would lead to a great apostasy. So he's not really giving us a great proof text for the great apostasy, if that's the case. In fact, in this part of the uh, cross-exam, he immediately started going after the reliability of New Testament apostles. Uh, as he, he thought that they were unreliable with respect to their eschatological assumptions. And that's when uh, it became clear that while he was attacking me for my historical linkage, uh, as it were, to some of the Protestant reformers, um, he is uh, he sees himself as unhinged, not only from the Old Testament, but also from the New Testament apostles in some sense. Yeah, and we, and we saw, I think we saw that multiple, Unhitched, sorry. Yeah, unhitched. We saw that, well, you could argue unhinged for some of the things <laughs> that you're saying. But, but yeah, we saw that multiple times, I think, in the debate where he was basically just questioning Paul altogether, you know, and, 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 and it was interesting. One of the things that we'll, we'll get into here, uh, as you kind of challenged him that, you know, he's, his willingness to throw apostles, his apostles under the bus, he was very willing, it seemed like, to throw Paul under the bus. And he was, you know, then he starts quoting from like the new perspectives on Paul and, and these kind of things, just really willing to kind of jettison, um, seemed to me just jettison scripture when it didn't fit his paradigm. At, by the end of the debate, we learned that Kwaku thought that Paul was sexist. Uh, by, by his response to Robert Vukic, one of the uh, Mormon apologists who spoke up in the Q&A, we learned that it seems Kwaku approved of Robert's view that Paul was a racist, uh, 
And uh, we learn that Kwaku believes that the apostles were unreliable, uh, that they that they essentially made false assumptions, perhaps even false teachings with respect to eschatology, to the end times. Um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, I, I sometimes I, li- I like to ask. Uh, a lot of Mormons throw their own apostles under the bus, so that's why I brought up Bruce McConkie. I kind of quipped that he was his favorite apostle, Quaku's favorite apostle. And Bruce McConkie was a very bold, stark, uh, doctrinally clear Mormon apostle, not like other modern Mormon apostles who sound like they're giving more uh, general ethical instruction that you could get elsewhere. And they're just kind of sappy sentimental, not really giving us revelatory authority. Um, uh, Anyway, Bruce McConkie is an easy target. Uh, Mormon liberals throw him under the bus and they kick hard. They do not like Bruce McConkie. They're, they are uh, supremely embarrassed by Mormon apostles like Bruce McConkie um, and Dallin Oaks and Boyd K. Packer. So uh, I, I like to ask, if you don't trust your own apostles, why should I? I, I thought the whole point of the restoration was to restore prophets and apostles. But what Mormonism has done is it's lowered the standard of reliability and integrity of modern prophets and apostles. The standards that the the Bible gives for evaluating the claims or the qualifications for prophets and apostles have have been turned into mush. And so uh, they don't, you know, they, it's kind of like they had to, they had to lower their standard for what an apostle really is dramatically just to kind of continue the category we think of an apostle as somebody who, when they teach publicly, God is, has restrained them from teaching any heresy. Uh, when Samuel was brought up to be a, a prophet in the Old Testament, it says that the Lord let none of his words fall to the ground. Uh, there's a kind of reverence and high expectation and high standard of uh, reliability, of accountability that you know we give to apostles and prophets. We refuse, evangelicals refuse to be in a religion where we have to throw our apostles or uh, prophets under the bus for what they publicly teach. Mormonism, uh, the, the digger, uh, the digger you deep, the, 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 the deeper you dig, uh, you find that uh, Mormons, um, I'm, this, I'm kind of a rabbit trail here, but I'll give you a real quick example. There's a talk that Bruce McConkie, a Mormon apostle Bruce McConkie gave called The Seven Deadly Heresies. He delivered this at BYU. And he uh, lists out heresies, some of which were taught by prior Mormon prophets, like uh, uh, Brigham Young. So Brigham Young, t- for example, taught that God is still learning. Uh, Brigham Young taught that Adam was God. And Bruce McConkie considered these deadly, damnable heresies. Uh, so there's there's a phrase that some of us use, what's doctrine today in Mormonism becomes heresy tomorrow, and what's heresy today becomes doctrine tomorrow. But it, it is interesting. I know this is, so it is a rabbit trail, but I think it's important for people as they're kind of just, you know, beginning their kind of head around Mormonism is that the, they would, they would say that the current prophet or, you know, the, that those of today, that that trumps uh, any like teaching from the past. Correct. I mean, so if, if, um, and, and they would say that the, all of the, I guess the teaching is, is still supposed to line up, but but that that um, they're not just beholden to the standard works that that the God is speaking through the prophet today, and what he, what 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 God is saying through the prophets today is more important than what he said in the past. Is that a, is that a fair? Uh... I, I I am sorry. I know I'm talking a lot in this interview, but I have to give like a minute answer to that if you don't mind. Um, maybe it's two minutes. Uh, there's different standards that Latter Day Saints use. So I have an article about this uh, about official doctrine on M- MRM.org, and the difficulty is that. The default cultural mainstream view, at least for decades past uh, within Mormonism, has been that this, the living prophet trumps the dead standard works. So scripture is seen as a dead letter. And the living, uh, breathing word comes forth from uh, general conference, especially out of the, the mouth of the living prophet. And that's, that's the functional operative view of, of, of practicing, believing, church going, the, you know, it's the default view of Mormons. But when you start to defend Mormonism, and when you start to really look at its history, what you find is that Mormon prophets have taught 
uh, things that are heretical by modern Mormon standards, things that today uh, are considered false teaching. So they have to come up with some sort of filter or uh, standard of officiality. So you'll hear a lot in Mormonism that, well, that was just his policy or his opinion. Uh, you know, that was just an apostle who said that, that not the prophet, or that, you know, the, the prophet only said that a few times, or that never made it into the canon. So you have two different you have two ends of the spectrum of maximalism and minimalism. The minimalism view among Mormon advocates says that you're only allowed to aim at the target of what constitutes official doctrine. And official doctrine is minimized to, and this gets really wild, it's minimized to that which is in the standard works and, so it's not just that, it's a subset of that, It's and it has to be recently emphasized uh, with a degree of repetitiveness in recent general conference talks. So if you talk to some BYU professors and say, hey, haven't your manuals taught X, Y, Z all the way up until the 21st century? Um, and you know the response is, well, that's not official doctrine. Uh, whereas uh, you'll get uh, an oscillation or a, a whiffling between different, waffling, <laughs> waffling between different views, uh, where other times they'll say, you know, it really doesn't matter what Doctrine and Covenants, I think 89 says about the Word of Wisdom. The, the, the Mormon scripture, when you really look at it in the Word of Wisdom section, this is their health code, encourages the drinking of beer. <laughs> and Oh, yes, it does. And if you go to fairmormon.org, which is a Mormon apologetics group, they acknowledge that in the historical context, this isn't, I mean, this is, uh, it's beer. It's just straight up beer. And the, and the drinks that were forbidden, uh, and forbidden, I, I use that word loosely, were more like hard liquor. But early Mormon leaders had distilleries. They drank beer. Uh, and and what's interesting is this section starts by saying not by way of commandment. It wasn't an obligation. It wasn't a strict standard. It wasn't, uh, you know, foisted upon the members. Um, it was basically a, a matter of counsel and advice and wisdom. Um, and it turned into a, a strict prohibitionist teetotaler standard, which, and here's the point, isn't in their scripture. That's not something they get from their scripture. That's something they get from their modern policy, which is treated like official doctrine. So this is really difficult, very difficult game that uh, evangelicals have to play or you know fight. Where Mormons they don't want to be held accountable for what their leaders have taught with respect to the nature of God or the gospel or race um, or it, you know lack of reliability, um, and yet Mormonism wants to parade and celebrate that it has modern prophets that can essentially trump what the standard works say. And that's a long, probably is way longer than two minutes, but uh, it, the whole issue of what constitutes official, binding, enduring doctrine is very messy in Mormonism. Well, that's, it's super important. I think it's, it's, it's such an important point because if, you know, when, if, if you come out here, you know, and, you know, I come out here and I've read, you know, one or two books, you know, when I moved out here this summer on, you know, on official, you know, old LDS teaching and you come out here and you say, well, you all believe this and this and this. They're like, no, we don't believe that. And you'll say, well, that's what your old prophets taught. And, you know, you just had this idea that because Brigham Young taught it or, you know, it was in the standard works that that's what all of the LDS believe today. And that's just not, that just isn't the case, right? Absolutely. You can't assume that what you read in their canon is what they teach today. The best book you can read about Mormon theology is a book called Gospel Principles. Basically, skip the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon was written, uh, it was published in 1830, and it, it, it represents early Mormon folk belief. It does not represent modern Mormon belief. Uh, but yeah, it's really important when you talk to Latter-day Saints today. Um, you have to ask them in general. You can make some safe assumptions sometimes and operate off those assumptions uh, with you know background evidence, but in general, it's good to ask what they per in particular believe because you know, for example, a lot of Latter Day Saints today, uh, I, I would say, well over half of church going millennial Latter Day Saints affirm same sex marriage, and they think that their own hierarchy, their prophetic, revelatory, apostolic leadership, you know, top presidential uh, authorities have it completely wrong about same sex marriage. And the the mainstream Mormon lay people, they they think their leaders, their the prophets and apostles are out to lunch over things like same sex marriage, which is by the way why I kind of uh, 
I, I use that as a as an example with Quaker to show that he really doesn't esteem his leadership. Yeah, I remember uh, that was in the that was I think that was in section that was in part three, right? And yes. when you yeah getting ahead of ourselves, my bad. Yeah, but I mean I think that's I think it's super interesting because like you said, I mean this is supposed to be the mouthpiece of God. I mean this is the you know the the president, the person who's you know these are the these are the these are it these are the apostles, and yet they're challenging their beliefs. But it is interesting, and then we can move back to the. But it is interesting that the seeds for this are so or seem like we're sowed in these personal revelations and this idea that I you know I can kind of get this own my own personal revelation verse versus a standard source like we would say the Bible is. Um, and so it is interesting that when those, you know, you say the chickens come home to roost a little bit where people are getting their own ideas of what is right and what is good and what is true is very, it takes us right back to, you know, to Genesis three, you know, in the garden where everyone's kind of deciding for themselves or, you know, judges when everyone's doing what's right in their own mm -hmm. eyes. Um, anyway, just in, very, yeah, interesting. So, um, okay. So Kwaku then, um, so uh, much like, I guess, in, in section one, there's, you know, a, a minute or two of his eight minutes, you know, with those sort of, um, you know, you know, you could just, just with those verses and his proof texts. And then um, he, he mentions the gates of hell passage, which we'll get to in your, because you mentioned in your opening statement. But then he really said, and the, basically his, his premise was, uh, the reason we know there was a great apostasy is because the Protestants and the Catholics were terrible, but really the Protestants were terrible. And then he just kind of zeroes in on Calvin and Luther. And, uh, and he reads from, you know, he, he reads uh, a quote from Luther's uh, book, uh, The Jews and Their Lies, that, uh, that Hitler actually was quoting and then kind of makes this long sort of drawn out uh, position that, you know, Hitler was just using Luther's quotes and, you know, this is all terrible. Protestantism is terrible. It's all evil you know, therefore that's, that's just example of the great apostasy, I'm guessing is kind of is sort of what he was trying to get out of. I wasn't quite sure what he was trying to get out of that in conjunction with this, but um, yeah, what's sort of your general uh, analysis of, and that was really the rest of his opening statement. What's sort of your general analysis of it? Let me kind of look at a couple specific examples. Protestantism doesn't depend on Luther or Calvin. And he goes after Luther and Calvin in his presentation as though they're foundational to Protestantism. Now, Protestantism says that the Word of God is our highest authority. It's our only written authority for uh, matters of faith and practice. It's binding and inerrant. Um, God has set aside the verbal inspired uh, revelation of the Bible in a, to be special. It's in its own special category. And so we submit ourselves to it. And so uh, for the Protestant, we could completely throw away Luther and Calvin. And I don't think Kwaku quite understood that. I, I told him in the debate, I could, if necessary, throw all of John Calvin under the bus. And he said, but you're a Calvinist. And I, I tried to make a little bit of a historical argument that Protestantism and even Calvinism in its conceptual roots precedes, you know, all of the Protestant reformers. And it has this historical precedent that goes, you know, all the way back to Augustine and earlier and all the way to Paul and the rest of the Bible. So uh, the way a modern you know, typical evangelical seminary student um, is going to wrestle with biblical issues, isn't going to be, you know, comparing, you know, Calvin versus Zwingli, although that might be an interesting, you know, part of a historical theology class. The the, the bigger issue is, you know, exegesis and uh, the, the original intent of scripture and uh, harmonizing all of the parts of the whole of scripture. We, we, we take, take quite seriously our submission to to the uh, unique uh, character of the verbally inspired Word of God, and I don't think he quite understood that. I, I, I think he really was just trying to score rhetorical points by showing the worst of Luther. Now, I, I freely admit the worst of Luther. Luther, at the end of his life, was uh, atrocious toward the Jews. He said abominable things, and Hitler totally uh, found a way to exploit those words and, um, you know, use them. I, it. it <clears throat> Side note, uh, Kwaku retweeted someone else's tweet that said that um, I believed uh, Hitler was in heaven because he was predestined to be a Protestant. There's so many. Yeah, let's just, can we just, let's, can we just like as a, I know it's a, an aside from an aside, but can we just maybe just zero in on that just for a second? Because I know this is like completely off topic, but um, I mean, this is such a prominent 
canard, I think, that people always throw at, at Christians, but certainly at Protestants, that Hitler was uh, a Christian because he had he used Christian symbols and, you know, uh, talked about Jesus. Um, is there any evidence? I mean, I don't know, maybe this is, again, completely off topic. Is there any evidence that you have whatsoever that, Jesus, uh, that, <laughs> geez, that Hitler was a, a, a believer? Two things. I don't have any evidence to believe he's a believer, and there's no evidence to believe that I believe he was a, that, that Hitler was a, a believer. There's no nothing I've ever said, you know, let alone in the debate that maybe well, gave well, the impression. Well, what he said was what I think what he, his position is, and again, I'm, so let's just I want to you know for the giving him as much um, you know still maybe yeah. yeah is that he I think what he's you said. Um, in this, we talked about this last week, uh, in, uh, in, in part one, you said, look, if, you know, you, you know, he quickly went through this, the worst person in the world, basically, but on it, but you know, at the end of his life, he gives his life to Jesus. Is he in heaven? Um, and you said categorically, yes, you know, that's, that's the gospel, right? It's salvation by grace through faith alone. And I think, you know, I think, so, you know, obviously maybe I can have Kwaku on and he can, you know, he can defend his own position, but I think what he thinks is because Hitler made passing references to Christianity and talked about Christian Christianity and, you know, and even had popes, you know, sort of uh, affirming what he was doing um, that, that you would say, yeah, because he, because he was a Christian, therefore it excuses all this stuff. But I think the, the reality though, is just because, I mean, the, the scripture tells us, and we see all throughout history, just because someone's professing to be a Christian means nothing about whether they actually are saved or not. Right. I mean, it's, it comes down to where, have they given their life to Jesus? Yes or no. And just because I say that I have means nothing. And so um, there's a, a, a Richard, um, Richard Weichart, I think is his name. He wrote a, he's written an entire book on um, the faith of Hitler that it's just because it's been used by so many atheists. I know Dawkins wrote a bunch about this and um, Peter Bogosian's written a bunch about this, um, you know, trying to make these cases that uh, make the case that, that Hitler was a Christian. And I think the evidence is just that, that he was uh, maybe some kind of like pantheistic, um, you know, Satanist at some, but it, you know, maybe a pantheist, but there's no evidence whatsoever that, uh, in any way, shape, or form, that he was actually a believer, and like you said, there's no, there's no way that you, you did not in any way make that claim. I think, I think he was just trying to put those two pieces together. Um, this is, this is not making a, uh, an argument. He's not really proving that the great apostasy happened at all, because you know, if if you have a trillion Hitlers on Earth, but you have the Church that endures to the end. You have genuine believers that are gathering as believers, functioning as, as intended in a basic essential way. Then the great apostasy didn't happen. There's still the kingdom of God. There's still the church. The, the gates of hell have not prevailed against it. So the existence of a Hitler, the existence of Protestant uh, reformers uh, doing terrible, atrocious things, that just doesn't phase us in the sense of showing that the great apostasy happened. What it does is it gre- it grieves us over how those who, using the name of Christ, uh, do things that are contrary to his name. One really interesting point here, in June uh, June 6th, 2009, or sorry, 2019, Kwaku said, quote, and this was, this was a video he did on YouTube uh, attacking atheists. Let's look at one of the biggest leaders who was an atheist in the past 200 years. Adolf Hitler. Let's be real for a second. The guy was an atheist. So if Kwaku really believed that, that Hitler was an atheist, and he never got a signal from me that I believed that Hitler was a Protestant, let alone, you know, a practicing, believing, genuine Protestant, uh, it it, it, it just goes into slander category, rhetorical wins category, gotcha stuff. It's not really making his case. It's not honest. It's not genuine. Uh, Yeah, I think you're, yeah, it goes to what we're saying. I mean, I think rhetorically it plays well again for some people, but yeah, from, from actual substance, there isn't much there. Um, a friend of mine who's, he's been on my podcast, who's ethnically Jewish, but he's a believer, uh, David uh, Halevi. So he, you know, he's, he's not a big fan of Luther, <laughs> but he, so he's not even convinced that Luther was a believer, but I think it, I mean, to your point, maybe let's just, I mean, if Luther wasn't a believer or even Calvin, if he wasn't uh, a believer, which, you know, I mean, anyway, evidence, I, I would, I mean, I disagree with them. I think obviously they were, but even if they weren't, that, that doesn't change any of the things that you were talking about. Because like you said, I think the one thing that Kwaku can, I just don't know if he understands, he, he, he thinks, I think he thinks that, that Calvin, 
and Luther invented these things and that's what you believe. Um, you know, that's what it seemed like what he was challenging, like kept going back to, you know, he, he said, he would say things like Luther was, Luther was the inventor uh, or Calvin was the inventor of, you know, what you believe, which I think you're, to your point, which is, no, you're, Calvinism and Lutherism, just because they're associated with their names, both of them are saying, this is what scripture says. So there's categories anything, of theology, with yeah, historical roots. Yeah. Yeah, we're Paulists, if anything, right? Or I mean, we're we're Christians because we think it goes all the way back to we're Petrine, Pauline, Johannine Christians. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, um, he mentions this. I don't know if you want to. If he just, I don't even if, you know if you want to mention this or not. But you know, he talked about the Servatius thing with Calvin, and I mean, he said uh, I actually quoted him on this because uh, I just think. I mean, I mean, again, rhetorically, maybe he's kind of getting away from himself. And so we'll give him some grace here. But Calvin actually set many people on fire. Um, you know, he, uh, yeah, I don't know what, where he would ever say that Calvin himself actually set many people on fire. Um, but then he, and then he said his followers played a large role in the genocide of, you know, essentially Native Americans and African slave trade. So he's just trying to, again, make sort of, his, again, his case, I think they was trying to make was, look how bad the Protestants were. Therefore, there was a great apostasy. Um, any any comments on any any of those uh, those things? Twofold. Historically, I think he's enlarging his case. He's amplifying and uh, he's using hyperbole. I don't think it would hold up the way he's described it. But for the sake of argument, I said in the debate, let's just grant that what you've said and how you've said it is true, and that it's actually ten times worse. That uh, doesn't really give you the great apostasy. It doesn't really change the fact that I go back to scripture. If, if I had even a secular uh, teacher, uh, I actually did have secular teachers at Wright State University when I was taking religious studies classes on the four gospels and so forth. Anything good that I learned about the scriptures, uh, ultimately, I give that to God. I give him the glory for that, and the scripture ends up being my final authority. Who taught me those things isn't the point. Uh, it, it, it doesn't really change things in the end. Um, there are Latter-day Saint scholars that have taught me certain things about the Bible. Um, and I, I would hope that, you know, someone like Quaker would have the integrity to say that Protestants have in conversation taught him things about the Bible. The, there's no genetic fallacy here that is genuinely going to give him credibility for affirming or disaffirming any of the debate propositions. Yeah. I mean, and, and again, even if that's the case, um, he still has to make the claim. I mean, basically what he, what, I mean, it seems like the best case, again, like you said, granting him as much as we can, the best case thing you can say is in the name of Jesus, there are people that did bad things. Um, but what follows and sometimes that, believers. Yeah. And so, well, yeah, right. And, and believe, I mean, Hey, uh, of which I am the foremost, but, um, but, but what, what follows from that is not, what he needs, which is there, therefore there's a total great apostasy. You just, you know, in fact, we, we see scripture telling us, you know, Paul again said, you know, what I want to do, I do not do. And what I do not want to do, I do. He said, um, I mean, again, I, I think rhetorically, he kind of, maybe he got a little carried away with it for himself, but, but, you know, he's Protestants were the ones that, um, you know, were in large part play a large role in the slave trade. When Protestant took over, Protestants took over seminaries, they banned black people from them. The Ku Klux Klan was started by Christians. I mean, again, just kind of making this rhetorical point that yes, uh, there are professing Christians who have done terrible things. And again, we would say, actually, that's exactly what Romans one and two uh, tell us, right? Um, that we're all evil. That's why we need a savior. But he did say this, which I don't know. And again maybe rhetorically, he was just kind of getting carried away, carried away from himself. But he, this is the way he closed it. And it sounded like he had typed this out because it wasn't like he was just, I mean, like he was reading it. Every, he said every single time Protestants had an opportunity uh, with great influence to do good, they chose to murder and kill a lot of people. That is the historical tradition, death and despair. That's actually was his closing statement. Um, again, I don't know where that gets him, but what's your, do you have any, any response to that or? Uh, this is hogwash. Uh, I'm not going to be kind about this. This, this is he's making stuff up. He's using hyperbole. He's he came to a debate with a bunch of Protestants, 30 minutes late, um, and he started his first presentation by doing personal attacks. And he decided not to actually make a case for the first two of three uh, debate propositions. And he basically, at the end of the debate, 
by, by the end of the debate, he said that the Protestants in the room were a hop, skip, and a jump away from becoming supporters of mass murder, rape, and American slavery. So that's that's not a genuine debate partner, in my view. That's not somebody that I think is a sincere. I've, I've got Latter-day Saint friends and coworkers and neighbors that I love as people. I love them. And, and I've got Latter-day Saint sparring partners, as it were, or frenemies, if you will, where we, we are able to, to, to hash out uh, so many important issues with vigor and passion and spirited defense. And sometimes we have to apologize to each other because we get carried away. But it doesn't get that bad, typically. It, it, that's, that, that kind of rhetoric is uh, just, it's, it's contemptuous of your audience. Uh, and I, I don't think it's appropriate uh, to make the point. Uh, I, I, you know, you, what you might, what we might want to talk about briefly here is at the climax, I think, of part two, um, I, I uh, tried to respond to statements about Calvin and Luther and Protestant reformers by talking about uh, idolatry and the sins of, of Mormon leaders. Is that something you'd want, maybe want to cover? Yeah, yeah. So I brought up that uh, idolatry is worse than murder. And there were some really interesting ethical uh, questions of like, well, is idolatry worse than, a, than genocide? And uh, uh, it's, it's kind of an awkward analogy. Um, I think I was thinking about this. I'd probably have to take an ethics course again to start thinking, this thing, start thinking these things through. But if I were to uh, curse my mother and then curse a thousand strangers, what would be worse qualitatively and categorically? I would say cursing your mother is its own kind of categorical cursing sin. There's, your mother is somebody that you especially are supposed to honor. You're supposed to honor na- na- uh, neighbors and strangers. Um, now, they're both bad. They're, both e- they're, both, uh, they're not both equally bad, I would say, but they're both bad and they're both worthy of hell. They're both worthy of punishment, condemnation from God. We both need mercy. We need mercy for both of them. But if you if you made these you know comparisons like well what if you c- cursed your mother once and then you cursed a hundred thousand strangers what would be worse and it just starts getting into weird ter- territory and the point I was trying to make is that and it was I think it was lost on Quaku and perhaps the audience is that um, there's a category or a, or a quality of a certain kind of sin here that isn't changed by the quantity of either side of the scale. Idolatry in the Bible is treated as the root sin and as the worst sin. Now, when Mormonism is a very man-centered worldview, it treats God himself as an exalted man. Uh, Men are gods in embryo. Men can become gods that are worshipped by their own progeny someday. Um, So sin in Mormonism is not ultimately a violation of our God's character. Getting back to this eternal law thing, sin in Mormonism is an aberration from the code or the system or the law of the cosmic order of the universe, which is attributable to attributable to no ultimate personal deity. Uh, it's just you know, our deity, our patriarchal cosmic regional deity in Mormonism ends up just being like a conduit or an intermediary, uh, kind of like a piano teacher who teaches you how to play the t- piano, but he himself learned or she himself learned from a prior teacher how to play the piano. Uh, it's hand-me-down you know, artistry. Uh, so sin in Mormonism really isn't ultimately an offense against God. And what's I think I hope this helps people kind of tap into what I was trying to get at. We had talked about David's murder in the debate. And what's fascinating about David's murder um, of Uriah, and I think some other men were killed too in that incident, his violation of Bathsheba. When the prophet Nathan confronts David, David repents by saying, I have sinned against the Lord. Now that's breathtaking. Uh, In Psalm 51, where David... uh, cries out to God for forgiveness, he says to God, against you and you alone have I sinned. And he goes on to say, deliver me from blood blood guiltiness. So when David murders a man and violates a woman, who has he ultimately sinned against? Against the Lord he has sinned. Um, So uh, there's, in, in the Christian worldview, 
sin, um, the definition is God-centered. Not Sin is uh, not God-centered, but the definition is God-centered. Sin is ultimately falling short of the glory of God. Sin is ultimately violating the ultimate standard of good, which is God. Remember my, my atheist friend Braden said, when you say God is good, you're basically just saying God is God. And I was like, melt my heart. I love what you just said. I love that. Yeah. Sin is a violation of the character and of, of God and it offends his holiness and it's a falling short of his glory. So the, what, what makes sin, sin? It's, it's really about our relationship with God. And so Romans 1 sets up uh, the sin problem of humanity as ultimately uh, a matter of us knowing that there's a creator worthy of our worship, who has these incredible, beautiful, eternal attributes, uh, eternal power and divine nature that, are, that, that should provoke us to a gratitude and a worship and an obedience. And instead, we, it, Paul says in Romans 1, we've exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. And on the basis of that, in response to that, God, uh, you know, uh, ironically responding to our exchange of the truth about God for a lie, hands us over to a kind of horizontal exchange where we exchange natural relations, natural sexual relations, for those that are unnatural, for those that are abhorrent. And it spirals downward. Uh, it, 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 it blows up into all these sort of interrelational human sins. But the root of it, the foundation of it, was, was uh, uh, idolatry. So one more point here is that when, when the Israelites are expelled from the land, or when the, when the Kings and Chronicles accounts of all the wicked and terrible kings of Israel is given, what is the chief and primary sin that these kings are held responsible for? Well, it was the Baals and the Asherahs. It was, the, it was idolatry. It was, it was the, the high places. Uh, was there bloodshed in the land? Yes. Was there sin against neighbor? Yes. And that is listed. But the chief sin over which they were expelled from the land and, and, and given over to the Assyrians and Babylonians was their idolatry. So when Brigham Young teaches that Adam is God or that, that, the, that our God is a polygamist deity in an ancestral line of an infinite, unending lineage of deities— when uh, Brigham Young teaches that we can become gods with a plural wives and we can become worshipped and send our own firstborn son as a savior for our own set of planets, Brigham Young is overtly and explicitly committing an act of idolatry, not just as a common layman, but as a prophet to the influence of, you know, the downstream influence of, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions and millions of people uh, and so the, the Christian conscience should see something like that and say, wow, that's right up there. And it's even worse than uh, cursing your mother or even killing another man uh, or killing a million men, because the bigger issue is how we relate to God. Now, that said, murder, why is murder wrong? Uh, why does murder warrant capital punishment according to Genesis 9-6? It's not because the blood of Jesus is insufficient to pay for the sin of murder, as Brigham Young taught. According to, to Moses in uh, Genesis 9-6, according to God, it's because we have killed someone who is in the image of God. It's because man is God's representative. We are his image bearer. And so to kill another man is like to burn God's effigy, as it were, his his embodied representative. Why was the murder of Jesus Christ so bad? Peter says in Acts 3, you killed the author of life. It's such a dramatic sin. So Brigham Young, when he teaches idolatry, I, it really should pain the conscience of a Latter-day Saint who has sustained this man as a imitable, living, uh, you know, once-living prophet uh, worthy of admiration and celebration, not just as somebody who taught some great things, but as somebody who was a prophet of God, a spokesperson for God himself, publicly teaching these things. So I know it was a long, long monologue, but I, I, I'm, I'm passionate that Christians would celebrate the God-centeredness of the Bible and how God seeks 
to do everything for his own glory. And that the, the, the penultimate terrible thing about Mormonism is that it, it um, leads people to hell. But the, but the ultimate bad thing about Mormonism is that it doesn't honor God for who he is. Yeah, and it's such a good point because, it, I mean, it's why we have such a drastically different view of sin. And like you even said that ultimately when we say it's it, like when you say we, it's, it's worse, you know, we sin against God and they just kind of look at you like, what are you talking about? Because it goes like, you know, this idea that what you've been talking about, the grounding of this sort of ethical law that's just out there. That's like you said, this platonic idea that's somewhere out there versus uh, God's nature and who God is. And, and then I think that, that all, the idea that the reason why um, idolatry is so is the is worse is because like you said, murder doesn't start, you know, just out, out there, right. It first starts by, um, displacing God. And then the outworkings of that, like we saw, you see, like you mentioned in Romans one is murder and jealousy and, and lying and, and all these other things that come from that. But it starts from when we, when we displace God. Um, and then, and, and that's why, and, I, and that's why people like you and, you know, in, in us, like that we wanted to come out here to, to even spend our time in these conversations with them. Cause this, cause it really matters because God's glory in his name matter and really this really does matter and it's not just like we're arguing philosophical systems here we're talking we are talking eternity like you said but we're all we're also talking about god's name and, and he is jealous for uh his name as as he should be um so i think that i think that was a great point i think that came up in your cross-examination and i think like you said i, I think that was it was just you know baffling to him but i think it would be baffling to anybody that that if your ethical system is rooted in sort of a platonic form and not in the nature of the uncaused first cause, um, the one who, you know, the I am, I think that, you know, it seems, okay, I understand how he can miss that. Um, and it, you know, it sounds so baffling to him. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a super important, uh, super important point. So, uh, again, that was basically, that was Kwaku's, uh, opening statement. Um, again, like we said, a couple of verses, and then he kind of spent a lot of time talking about people who, uh, have done bad things, professing to be Christians, you know, either Christians who, uh, who, who were Christians, but they've just you know, done, done bad things as all of us have, or professing Christians, uh, who weren't. Um, all right. So then you had a chance to present your opening statement. And so, um, yeah, why don't you, um, you know, you, 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 you kind of made the points, Jesus did not let the church die and then, you know, use some verses, but maybe just kind of walk through your opening statement. So there's some straightforward statements that scripture gives us, uh, Matthew 16, 18. I know that Quakey brought that up. He tried to preempt it. And when I started quoting it, you'll see in the video, he gives a big smirk, uh, but Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is a really controversial verse uh, in Christian history, let alone Mormon history, um, uh, because Protestants, for example, have been eager for the rock, excuse me, not to be Peter. And so we've, we've maybe said, well, maybe this is like the, the testimony of you know, of, of the gospel. Uh, but I think the most straightforward reading, and I think a lot of modern interpreters converge on this, you know, the rock that Jesus speaks of here is Peter. He, he does a foundational uh, work of spreading the gospel of, of, of he, he is an instrument of the building of the church. Um, that church Jesus says, I will build my church. So Peter's not ultimately the builder of the church. It's, it's Jesus who builds the church. And Jesus says, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And it, uh, the pronouns here are offensively simple. The it is the church. Uh, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. So you, at the very minimum, you have to extrapolate from this that the church isn't something to be prevailed against. Uh, and Jesus is using the foundational work uh, of Peter, uh, the instrument of Peter, to build the church. Um, and uh, so this is a very straightforward statement. If this was the only statement we had, maybe it wouldn't be a good case, maybe, for, you know, uh, for, against the great apostasy. The rest of the Gospel of Matthew, though, makes it really clear that Jesus believes the kingdom has been planted 
in a, in a durable and perpetual, unstoppable, uninterruptible way. And we will get that to that uh, later. But Mormonism treats uh, this verse as really about revelation. So the rock of, I think it's the rock of uh, revelation, um, the the revelatory experience that one has, like Peter had, they would say, is a, the thing upon which the church is build, built. And a lot of modern Mormon apologists say, well, Jesus died and was resurrected. Why can't the church die and be resurrected? That's their argument. Uh, so uh, I, I just present the verse as a straightforward evidence that Jesus means for us to see the church is something that is built to be durable and uh, to withstand the gates of hell, to, to advance. Um, we get that at the end of Matthew, like I said earlier, Jesus with a view to the evangelism of all the nations. When he says in the Great Commission to make disciples of all the nations, he says, I will be with you to the end of the age. Um, so we have, before we get to the other Matthew stuff, we have these beautiful metaphors in the Gospel of Matthew, or sorry, in, in the New Testament in general, of Jesus as a groom to a bride. So Ephesians 5 treats Jesus as the groom who has laid his life down for the bride, who nourishes the bride. Uh, it, he is something the, husband's, uh, the husband in a marriage is to imitate in protecting and providing and nourishing his bride. Uh, Jesus is spoken of in John 10 as a good shepherd, and he's described as a shepherd who faithfully tends to his flock, and he effectively gathers his sheep, and he protects uh, those that are his own. Uh, they can't be snatched from the Father's hand. Um, Jesus says in John 15 to his disciples that they would, uh, he says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So Jesus treats uh, the disciples as um, fruit-bearing uh, workers that bear the kind of fruit that ultimately persists. It abides. So, um, yeah, it's, it's very beautiful when you attach all these metaphors together, and it's, <clears throat> I, it, uh, you know, there's, there's other passages I could have used, you know, kind of squishing. I, it's, by the way, side note, I had eight minutes for the presentation, and by some miracle, I finished in six minutes and 30 seconds, which is crazy to me because I prepared and rehearsed this, and I didn't think I'd do that, but uh, yeah, you want to... I, then you had some time, which we could actually mention here in a second, but you, then you had some time for just some, uh, I think you just, you went, um, you went pastoral there for a few minutes and just kind of had a chance to speak to some of the LDS president. All right, so let's just deal with... Uh, Kwaku's response, we actually, he, because again, he, like you said, he preempted it in his opening statement. His response to the Matthew 16 passage was, um, yes, Mormons don't believe that the gates of hell uh, have one because of the restored church. So basically what his point is, yes, we agree with that passage, but it's because the, of the restored church, the LDS church, that that is true, uh, that you know, the gates of hell didn't, didn't prevail. Uh, any, any response to that? It doesn't seem like a straightforward, natural reading of the text. Um, it doesn't give us any assurances that the Latter-day Saint Church right now won't go into apostasy again. So it's really interesting that uh, the New Testament gives assurances that the church would persist. The Mormons say it didn't, it died. The kingdom of God was obliterated from earth. Oh, but by the way, now that it's been set up and restored, now it won't die. Now it'll persist. Now it's unstoppable. So there's a kind of glory to the ministry of Joseph Smith in gathering a, fl a, a flock, as it were, I'm stretching the metaphor here, but in gathering, you know, Joseph Smith's sheep. Now, they would attribute this to Jesus, but Joseph Smith ends up doing a better job than Jesus uh, at, at work that they say assuredly won't uh, fail now. It, it will abide now. Well, why ought we not attribute those same kinds of promises to the first century Christian church? Yeah. Um, all right, so then you then you 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 hit on Matthew thirteen specifically the parable of the wheat and the tares. So I wanted to um, I wanted you to talk about that for a minute because then um, you also talked about how Joseph Smith uh, in his um, the way that he sort of uh, translated that parable uh, basically, basically changed the entire meaning of the text. We talked about this last week with his when he talked about the parable of the prodigal son, how he 
reinterpreted that in, in Romans 4, reinterpreted it. So um, maybe would you speak to uh, Matthew 13 and, and the way in which the LDS have interpreted that parable? Matthew 13 gives us four parables, kingdom growth parables, the first of which is the parable of the sower, where you have four different soils, and Jesus explains why some who initially receive the word, and it's interesting, the word is what is the is the instrument or the mechanism of spreading or growing the kingdom. Um, but Jesus gives us an explanatory framework for why certain individuals uh, would fall away um, or not take root. So that definitely would not lend itself to or the great apostasy. It's, it's talking about individual apostasy. But after that first foundational parable, Jesus gives three kingdom growth parables, the first of which is the parable of the wheat and tares, the wheat and the weeds. And in this parable, Jesus talks about how the Son of Man, it was all, it's interesting, Jesus gives the parable more cryptically, and then his disciples ask him to give an explanation for the parable. And Jesus literally gives his own interpretation of the parable. And by the end, you learn that Jesus believes that the Son of Man has planted uh, wheat in the field. And at night, when the workers are asleep, uh, uh, Satan comes, the evil one comes, and he plants evil seed, the bad seed. And the workers ask the, the master the next morning, hey, shouldn't we uproot the bad seed? And the master says, no, because if you do that, you'll uproot the good seed. And so Jesus explains that it isn't until the end of the age, the, uh, the, the harvest, where uh, there's an uprooting and then a throwing of the bad, uh, the, the, the tares, the, the weeds, into the, you know, into the fire and uh, so after this, well, a- after the initial giving of this parable, um, there's two other parables. There's the parable of the mustard seed and the parable of the leaven. And they're very brief, like a sentence or two, at, uh, I think, the, of, the, of other representations of an initial uh, small seed, for example, that becomes this giant tree. Uh, that that durably and perpetually and unstoppably grows into something pretty incredible or spreads, as it were, the leaven. So uh, what I did in the debate is I pointed to the work of a Latter-day Saint author named Charles Harrell. And he uh, wrote what I think is the best historical Mormon theology book available today. It's called This Is My Doctrine, That uh, sorry, uh, this is my doctrine, the development of Mormon theology. Now, I, I, by the end of the book, you realize that Charles Harrell is like a secular progressive agnostic who doesn't really value, uh, he doesn't really think that the truthfulness of the LDS church really ultimately matters. Um, so he ends up being kind of a, uh, I don't know, even a little postmodern in some sense. But he does an excellent job otherwise, at least with respect to surveying the historical developments of Mormon theology. And what he alerted my attention to was early interpretations of these three parables by Joseph Smith. And he he observes that the parables straightforwardly given give us a sense of the kingdom's uh, enduring growth. It's uh, even in the face of threat, even in the coexi- with the coexistence of the tares, the, the weeds, the kingdom is protected and preserved, and it perpetuates until the harvest at the end of the age, and it has this kind of slow, perpetual growth, uh, and it, it, it endures. So Joseph Smith, at some point in his career, realizes that these parables don't mix with the great apostasy and restoration narrative. So what he does is he argues that, well, he gives a whole new scripture. I think it's DNC DNC 86, where he starts by saying, concerning the parable, and he throws back to the parable of the wheat and tares, and he gives his own interpretation. And Joseph Smith argues that uh, essentially a second growing season was required, that there was an uprooting and a replanting uh, of the kingdom, and that this this is theologized elsewhere to be the great apostasy and the restoration. He also does this essentially uh, well, he recasts the other two kingdom growth parables, that of the leaven and the mustard seed, to refer to the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon and to refer to uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, 
So uh, Joseph Smith takes the words of Jesus, which are pretty straightforward, and he subverts them. He supplants them. Uh, he uproots them. He, you know, if if he if you could say that he, uh, Mormonism gives Joseph Smith a free pass, not only to contradict straightforwardly the very assurances of Jesus about the enduring growth of the kingdom. It gives Joseph Smith a free pass for, as I went on to say, Joseph Smith in one of his last sermons, he uh, is in a very arrogant mood. If you read the sermon. And he he tries to uh, pick up on the language of sec- I think Second Corinthians eleven, where Paul is dealing with these Corinthians who have these visiting apostolic messengers who ha- who give their own apostolic credentials, and Paul and these are these are false apostles. Paul gives his own so called credentials, <laughs> and he leans into his own suffering, and it's a kind of cheeky appeal to the stripes on his back for his credentials. Um, so Joseph Smith, though, he, he tries to carry the tradition of this re- rhetoric. And what he ends up doing is he ends up straightforwardly boasting about having suffered more than Paul and about having done more to keep the church together than Jesus Christ himself. He says, I boast that no one has done such a work as I. The followers of Jesus ran away from him. The Latter-day Saints haven't run away from me yet. So I present this boasting quote. It's a very famous boasting quote of Joseph Smith as a, I, I, I situate it within the New Testament theology of the glory of Jesus Christ as this king who sets up a kingdom that would not be shaken, Hebrews says, hearkening back to an Old Testament scripture. Uh, a planter that doesn't need uh, his plants to be uprooted. Uh, somebody who dies for his bride to preserve, protect, and nourish her. A, sh- a good shepherd who effectively gathers and protects his sheep. Um, and so for Joseph Smith to boast uh, that he has done uh, a better job of that than Jesus, and that Jesus essentially failed at that, uh, really strikes at the heart of Christianity. Um, it really, I think it should offend the conscience of anybody who's genuinely trying to lift Jesus up as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yeah. So are you, so do you, are you saying that in the wheat and that when in uh, back in um, Matthew 13, when um, Jesus says in verse 40, therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age that Joseph Smith is saying that was the end of whenever the first, second century or third century, whenever the great apostasy started and that then there was a second period or is that is that what is that is that what you're saying his interpretation of it is uh let me look at the passage so at verse 25 it says while his men were sleeping joseph smith picks up on that and he says aha that's when there was a break and so i think he construes verse 40 or would you say uh 30 yeah 40 i think he might construe that to be the uh end of the restoration age i think okay. so I, I, so he's I combining so he's combining so he's saying there's the sleeping there that we see in verse 25 that that is when that's basically the time when we when we lost the priesthood authority and all that and then um then it was restored and then you've got the end of even the restoration which is in verse 40 i, I would need to re- revisit the details i'm sorry I, I i have to give a tentative answer but he even he flips on some of the details to like the the order of the the judgment, the inverting, uh, he inverts the, uh, you know, uh, let me see here. Well, I mean, if he's trying to make it <laughs> say something that it's not, then it doesn't. It's not going to flow yeah. nicely. So obviously, he's going to have to try to do some mental gymnastics with the words to try to make it fit within his, you know, eisegesis of the text. Yeah, Luke Wayne and I did some podcasts on this, and he went through with a fine tooth comb through DNC 86 and the parable of the uh, wheat and tares. And we, we, we drew contrasts uh, to all the way different ways that Joseph Smith uh, messes with the details of the parable, but uh, it, it's pretty embarrassing. So Mormon scholars, they take a few different approaches. They, but one of the common approaches is that they argue that uh, 
Joseph Smith, maybe he really isn't reinterpreting the parable. Maybe he's just co-opting the language of the parable. Maybe he's likening a new parable to this parable. Uh, the problem, though, is that DNC 86 starts with, essentially, I'm going to explain the parable to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so uh, like you said, the very end of your opening statement, you had a few, t- you had a, you had a few, few minutes left um, you, you know, during that time, we talked a little bit about this last week, you know, just kind of, you were talking about how, you know, you were, your mannerisms were a little bit more, you were a little bit more fired up than certainly in Kwaku, but you actually, but then you actually, you, you actually said Kwaku is a false teacher. Um, and you, you know, you challenged him on that. And then you kind of spent some time, uh, talking to the audience. Um, what, what, what was your, why, why, yeah, why that, why did you think that was, you know, sort of appropriate at the time. I know we, we talked about this a little bit last week in, in regards to your history with him and, you know, you're, you're the, you're, the, you're thinking this might be your last debate and those kind of things, but is that, was that sort of what was going through your mind? A couple of things. One is you can just tell right now from our discussion that I get fired up about this topic. This, yeah, as you should, right? I mean, this is like we just talked about, this is serious. Jesus's honor and his reputation is at stake here. Uh, he ought to be, uh, uplifted for the king that he was, that set up a kingdom that wouldn't be shaken. <clears throat> he gets the glory for what he did in planting the church that never needed an uprooting. And J- Joseph Smith's boasting of having done a better job of keeping the church together than, than Jesus Christ, uh, that offends me as a Christian. And uh, for Joseph Smith to be esteemed as this almost messianic-like figure in Mormonism uh, this head of the last and final dispensation, uh, they sing a praise song to him in their hymn book. They have a so- song called Praise to the Man, and they sing praises to the man, Joseph Smith. Um, so this is this is abhorrent, and I think that uh, I was tapping into a moral sentiment here of how inappropriate this was. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty caught off guard with having an extra minute and a half, so I, I was just on the heels of recounting Joseph Smith's famous boasting quote and in a in 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 the throes of uh glorying in Jesus Christ as the good shepherd that kept his sheep together so um I was I was fired up and I thought you know I should explain to the audience why I'm fired up uh partly and it was in part because uh Kwaku to me was not a um it's not like we're having a fun debate over PC versus Mac or Ford versus Chevy or, you know, um, Microsoft versus Apple, whatever. This, this stuff is deadly uh, if, if not treated rightly. It's life or death. And Kwaku is not a uh, mere... Um, happy-go-lucky, cute, you know, just having fun kind of guy. Uh, Kwaku is a false teacher. Now, when I said that, I, later I learned he was really offended by that. Um, but categorically, he thinks of me as a false teacher, at least as, as you know, with respect to the definition of the term. Uh, a teacher who's teaching something of severe importance that is false to people in public uh, with an influence. Uh so I was trying to press really hard on this, and I, I really was straightforwardly calling the audience to repent of esteeming Joseph Smith and giving him a free pass for boasting over and against Jesus Christ. Um, so, man, I... so. Most of, I'd say 98% of my evangelism is conversational, one-on-one, gentle. In Utah, you have to be pretty slow, even with your cadence, your rhetoric. You have to be, you have to ask a lot of questions. Uh, It's not like when a New Yorker or a Chicagoan comes to visit and there's a little bit more lively nature to the discussion. Utahns are pretty hypersensitive in spirit uh, to interfaith discussion. So there's a lot of careful, gentle hand-holding. Um, some of what I do is, st- is street preaching. Um, and street preaching, it taps into a different range of communication, uh, a different 
area of the range of communication. And it affords you opportunity to stress different aspects of the gospel. So uh, when you herald or stress or um, trumpet uh, the lordship of Jesus Christ and the forthcoming uh, second coming of Jesus and heaven and hell and the resurrection, there's a, there's a different aspect to the message that you can communicate to that. There's also something uh, appropriate and unique to uh, that kind of heralding mode where you can call people to the severity of repentance. And this was a straightforward moment of calling people to repentance and calling out the arrogance of Joseph Smith. Um, the problem, though, is that I was, uh, I was really amped up. I, I say problem. It's really a trade-off. It's, 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 there's certain styles of communication that are valid but not strategic. Right, so we we have brothers on the street sometimes who, in conversation, might say something that's totally legitimate, and the way they said it is totally legitimate and valid and defensible, um, but it might not be a, a wise, uh, it might not be optimal, uh, it might not be strategic. So if I had to go back in time, what I would do probably is try to have a kind of uh, uh, compassionate boldness where there's a weaving in and out of bold proclamations and calls to repentance, and then also a, an appeal, a pleading, a soft, gentle, compassionate pleading with my audience um, concerning these things. Uh, I, I think it's tough in a debate like that with a false teacher like Kwaku. I'm trying to herald the gospel. I'm trying to rebuke the false teachings of a false teacher. I'm going after the very person of Joseph Smith, who's much worse than Kwaku is, um, and I'm trying to also reach uh, a crowd of Latter-day Saints, many of whom I've never met, and I don't know their background. I don't know where they're at in life. Um, so there's trade-offs there to to doing that. Um, but I don't know. I'd be interested to know what you thought. I, I, I'm not offended at all if, if people think, hey, Aaron, you probably should have calmed down <laughs> in that moment and uh, showed some more gentleness or kind of cool-headed uh, calmness. No, I was thinking, I mean, I immediately thought of, I know the context, I don't know if you're in your the context might be a little bit different in like in Titus one, you know, talking first he's talking about elders, but um, you know, so maybe the context there is is of the church, but it, you know, but the for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole households, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Now we're not saying that Quaker is doing this for dishonest gain, but there are people that will listen to his videos that, um, you know, or will even, because he's a, you know, he's a nice guy, he's funny, whatever that, you know, that we see what 70, I think the statistic I saw was 75% of LDS converts come from a, like a Protestant background. Hmm. Um, and, and, and so he's a, like you said, I mean, he's a false teacher who is, who, who, whose mouths must be stopped. Um, in, in households and people are, are their self, this is, you know, salvation's at stake. So I, I it was interesting um, after rewatching the debate, because when I, you know, when I was there, um, and maybe it was just because I was, you know, in moderator mode and was just trying to like, I was more nervous about trying not to, you know, just do all the tasks I was supposed to do. But um, it, it was interesting when I rewatched the debate, everything that I thought sounded a little bit harsh, harsh sounded less harsh when I rewatched it. Does that make sense? I mean, so mm -hmm. I watched it again. And I was like, actually, this does, this is a, I don't know. Like it was interesting. Cause I thought when I would watch it that, um, yeah, that, cause it, you know, especially, you know, the, like we, we've talked about different critiques of, of it and everything, but I was less, um, I was actually thought it was an appropriate amount of harshness because I, and again, I think this goes back to what we were talking about last week is I just don't think, and again, you know, like I said, me being here for like six months, I mean, I'm just a baby to all this stuff, but I don't think that it's just different. People don't realize the difference of being out here. And, and you know, and, and there are, there are uh, Christian pastors here that I know that uh, probably have different opinions on this that have been here for, you know, way longer than I have, but there is something about, you know, just you in front, you know, calling him out as a false teacher, not, not him, not because you have any, you know, animosity toward him, but if what he's saying is, uh, is taking people away from the true gospel and he's pre presenting it as true, then there needs to be a challenge to that. And it needs to, I mean, it's not, and it's not a, um, Hey, we just disagree. Like you said, we're disagreeing between Mac and PC or our favorite flavor of ice cream. We're not talking about that kind of thing. So, 
when Jesus in a Holy Week went into the temple and turned over the tables, um, would you have, have you seen? This is interesting because uh, Quaker did an, a video um, recently. I don't know if you saw this, where he's basically justifying why he's sort of takes the tact that he uses, and he actually uses that uh, analogy, or he talks about that as to why um, is part of the justification he has for sort of attacking. Um, I don't know, do you see that? Yeah, in the debate he played himself off as cool and as uh, calm and collected. But elsewhere in his video YouTube persona, he is very theatric and very forceful at times, or, you know, in the, in the worst of it, you know, mocking me as Hitler um, and, and with, with dramatic music. So it's kind of a play. It's kind of a, uh, I don't know. It's, it's very convenient. It's very particular to the situation. My personal opinion is that there are were at least certain moments within that debate that uh, called for a kind of forceful uh, trumpet. Uh, sometimes Jesus played the flute softly, like with the woman at the well in John 4. And sometimes he put down his flute and he got his trombone out or his, his, his tr- tr- trumpet out, like in John 8, when he went after the Pharisees. And it's good for their, in the body of Christ, to be believers that utilize the full range of the biblical communicative methods of uh, whispering and trumpeting the gospel. Um, And we need Christians to go out in front and do that at times. Um, I'll be honest, it it comes at a social cost. And uh, when you use, when you use that amount of passion, um, it's kind of like the difference between using a squirt gun and a fire hose. It takes a whole lot more, um, wherewithal to control the direction of a fire hose when it's on full strength. And so there's a risk to using lots of passion. It's just like anger. Anger can be very righteous and controlled, but it's also very dangerous. And it's like fire. It's like playing with fire. So um, there are places in the debate where I wish I would have, uh, you know, lowered the, the, the PSI of the hose. Uh, but I, I think it's important for Christians to have at least within their sensibilities a sense that at times uh, our Christian brothers are going to use, they're going to go beyond the Overton window or beyond the uh, accepted range of sensible, irenic, uh, academic, proper decorum for what constitutes proper communication for that context. And, and in order to get somebody's attention uh, you know, there, there's, there's a time and a place for that. And I, 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 but I want to be very careful. I want to be open to critique though, to, um, cause, cause there's a, there is a bad evangelist tradition of excusing the misuse of passion, uh, by appealing to our own personalities or our own sense of felt calling, uh, in, in our, in life. Um, so I, I want to be forever open to critique. Uh, and I've got, I had good brothers that say, Hey, Aaron, uh, you, you went beyond uh, being passionate to being caustic or acerbic at times. So I've, I've tried to weigh that and, and debrief that and, and kind of, you know, um, s- ruminate on that. I, I don't want to be callous to that. Yeah, but I do. I just think that it is interesting. I think maybe when I first started, you know, when I first started getting into apologetics and, you know, just... I was very, it was more in, you know, the, the philosophy was very interesting and, you know, you want to have these really, you know, interesting debates on, you know, these, you know, philosophical topics that are very, you know, important, but I don't think that, I don't think I really had a right understanding of like, like, so we're not talking, like you said, we're not talking about Mac versus PC. We're not talking about favorite flavor ice cream. And so that this, this is, this is the this is the the holy God that <laughs> the uncaused first cause the creator of everything and who is like you said who's jealous for his name and there there is a group you know that is that has taken all I mean just like we've talked about multiple times here and you think about going even back to the garden have taken all of the truth many of the truth claims of uh, the one true God and of, of biblical Christianity and have just flipped it on their head and perverted it and there does need to be a, you know, that, that is serious. And I think the other thing that I think is, in, I think I, as I was reflecting on this, I, I, I was wondering if a lot of what people were um, sort of maybe pushing back on you about or, or was because 
their own personality was certainly not one that would do that, you know? And so, um, because I wouldn't necessarily do that, um, you know, th therefore that's the right way to do it. And I think, like you said, there, there's different personalities and there's, there is a time, you know, like we said with Jesus, there's a time when Jesus is flipping tables and there's another time, um, you know, when people, have, you know, when he, when he's, you know, as, as gentle, gentle. as a dove. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that um, a lot of people see that and I, you know, and, and because of their own personalities, maybe say, well, I, you know, that's not how I would do it. Well, that's fine. But we, I mean, we see all throughout scripture and, and, you know, I'm not trying to equate you, you know, to these, but you know, we see scrout scripture of, um, President. yeah, like, I mean, uh, you know, Elijah is not exactly just, you know, being gentle with the prophets of Baal when he's, you know, he's mocking them and just, you know, just, I mean, just, there's, there's also I, something about a debate. There's something about a formal structured environment. Let me, let me give a very dangerous analogy here. Uh, it's never okay to punch someone on the street. But it is okay in a boxing ring, in a boxing match, with gloves on and a referee to punch. Now, that's a dangerous analogy because I'm not promoting violence here. But rhetorically speaking, you know, by analogy here, when you're behind a, essentially a pulpit at a structured dialogue, a structured debate, where it's religious in nature and it's adversarial in nature, you have propositions that are being affirmed and disaffirmed and argued for and against if the debate's going properly, um, that is especially a safe and proper place in general. I, I, how, about, how about this? It is more often, it is more so appropriate in general for spirited, fiery, passionate communication to happen there than it is at the dinner table with your kids or with a neighbor. That, that, the, way, the way I spoke behind that uh, uh, pulpit uh, would not have been appropriate in a one-on-one -on -one conversation at the North Gate of Temple Square with a sweet, you know, young adult uh, college student, Mormon I just met. Um, I One of the things I've been really frustrated by is that, you know, in decades past, evangelical and Mormon interactions uh, have tried to model interfaith, interpersonal, gentle, dialogical communication um, on stage with uh, an evangelical scholar talking to uh, a BYU professor who is completely misrepresenting the truth and even misrepresenting Mormonism. Um, it, it seems like there's certain contexts where um, it's not appropriate to be gentle. It's not appropriate to be soft uh, or genteel. Um, it, it, at the very least, at the very least, I don't want to prescribe it strict mode of communication for these contexts, I, sh I should at least walk away understanding that you think this is a big deal and that you, you're you really bothered by uh, the opposing viewpoint here because it's not a, an intellectual game to you, uh, that, that you really believe what you say, that you actually believe this, that uh, you, you, you're not, you're not, you don't actually think that you can socially engineer or out nice the other person to somehow convince them to believe what your scripture otherwise teaches is a miracle if they would hear the word of God and believe it. Uh, it, it, it do you really think the word of God is central here? Um, I, I, I hope people can hear my heart behind that and also um, hear that 98% uh, of what I do is conversational, gentle, slow, low volume, lots of listening, lots of dead silence evangelism. Um, and there's just different contexts. Uh, I, I would also have a little bit of a plea for mercy from my brothers. That's a hard context to be in uh, when you're doing things on the fly, where you're, you're nervous, your heart rate's racing, and um, you're trying to communicate with severity and passion. And you're not, you're not a James White with a, you know, what is it? <laughs> and in a in a kind of steel, you know, even keel uh, personality. Um, so I, if you think I made mistakes and I there was some splash damage to the fire hose, I'm sorry. Uh, I I will I'll try to grow as a Christian and and uh, practice more self control and and more uh, restrained passion and directed passion where where it's appropriate and try to be more overtly gentle with uh, a Latter-day Saint audience where is appropriate. Uh, 
but I, I hope you can understand the passion that I have for the content at stake. Yeah, yeah that's that. I mean, that, and that's like I said, I think on my second viewing of it, that's why I was like, actually, there's there was nothing when I watched it the second time, I was like, no, I think it didn't even seem even the first part where I, you know, at first I thought I didn't even it didn't even seem like you were interrupting as much as I thought. So I don't know, it just I don't know if it was just like the environment or what, or maybe it was just me. My it's dramatic. It's yeah. very dramatic, the whole yeah. thing. Um, all right. So I know we're, we're running on time. So but, um, I want to talk about two, two things from, the, from your cross. But um, you mentioned something. So maybe was, I just want to, I mean, I, I certainly don't want to do this. I don't want to just, I don't want to ascribe any motivations to Kwaku. So let's remove Kwaku from the sure. discussion. Do you think that, um, so are, are there, and I'm, are there Mormons that you talk to that you think are are doing that that it is a game that they're just that it's Mormon apologists that are just wanting to win an art you know just wanting to uh, win the argument not really worried about truth you know so again not let's let's remove Kwaku from this because I don't want to disparage disparage him or whatever but do you find that as the case um, with with people that you talk to because. It just seems, it seems like some of the times that I'm, you know, the question, you know, it's, I'll, as long as I can come up with some kind of any scenario that kind of plausibly fits the, this fact that gives me some evidence for my position, then, you know, I'll kind of go there. It doesn't really matter if I really believe that or not. I'm just kind of, you know, that I come across that with certain people that I've talked to. Do you find that to be the case or? I'll give you some examples. Um, I've seen Robert Bowman. He's an apolog- uh, a Christian apologist I highly respect. And he has chimed in a little bit on the situation with the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious... Oh, goodness. I can't finish the acronym. It's like N-A-M-I-R-S or something like that. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute, if you want to shorten it. Um, It used to be Farms. And Farms was an apologetic organization out of BYU. And they used to be more boisterous and uh, overt and uh, more interested in defending what they thought was the truth of Mormonism. Now, I think they were a bunch of false teachers. But I think they largely believed Mormonism was true. Now, farms essentially got dismantled and its key player, Daniel Peterson, was kicked out. And... um. The, the there's a new organization called the Mormon Interpreter, and their complaint against the BYU guys now has been like, shouldn't we be defending the Latter Day Saint gospel? Like, isn't this a real issue that like, uh, like uh, we're not really trying to just be friends with the rest of academia, are we? We're not just trying to be, we're not trying to be like the world, are we? We're not just trying to have it ha- to to be accepted fully into the community. That's not the highest goal. The goal is the LDS gospel. And so the Mormon interpreter uh, was pretty upset about the whole the, the series of developments there. Um, the guys at at BYU, I, I'll just give some touch points here. A lot of these guys think that their own leadership is out to lunch on sexual ethics. A lot of these guys think that the the prophet and apostles are out to lunch on same sex marriage, despite what they've said publicly about it as prophets and apostles. Um, despite what their own scripture teaches. Um, A lot of these guys believe things that they would be careful not to clearly and overtly communicate to their lay people. The way they they end up defending their own church uses arguments that the lay people aren't even aware of and would be shocked by. Uh, I'll give you, sorry, this is all bunch of rabbit trails that are possible here. There's one example I can think of right now where Mormon scholars are arguing about, oh, there's this gloriously, there's this glorious mess that they're in, where it looks like the best available evidence is that Joseph Smith was not, he didn't have the the freedom to be that much of a creative co-participant in the translation process. It looks like that he was more of a dictator. If you read the early accounts of how the "Quote unquote" translation happened. It looks like he's just dictating phrases. Well, that has not been compatible with the observation by other Mormon scholars that it looks like there are Protestant 
categories, you know, uh, terms, theologies, debates, uh, things that are particular to Protestantism that somehow made their way into the Book of Mormon, this ancient Native American text. So Mormon scholars have tried to argue, well, maybe Joseph Smith was given a kind of creative license to be a creative co-participant, to modernize the language at times, to insert his own apocryphal stories. Uh, Blake Osler takes the position that Joseph Smith actually expanded the Book of Mormon uh, beyond its ancient core to include things that were contemporary to his own time. So the problem, though, is that there's a dictation premise you have to deal with. And so what modern Mormon scholars are realizing is that Smith is basically lifting the King James language. So what they are arguing about right now is whether or not there was a an English translation previously accomplished in the early modern English era, in the Protestant Reformation era, of the Book of Mormon, that God somehow inspired a person or a team of persons to translate the ancient text of the Book of Mormon into English. And what Joseph Smith did while having his head in a hat looking through a magic rock was that he was dictating uh, ancient, well, English text translated already from ancient Reformed Egyptian accomplished a hundred years, a couple hundred years ago. If the, com- if the common Mormon knew that Mormon scholars were going back and forth about this, the common Mormon would be like, what the heck are you talking about? That goes against like so many straightforward teachings of our leaders. This isn't a game. You can't just treat like you can't just make stuff up. You can't just reconfigure the entire account, the entire narrative. What are you doing? Uh, and, and like, so you'll you'll talk to Mormon scholars, and the scholars like it's like where what? I'll give some more straightforward exam, examples that are short. If um, sometimes a Latter-day Saint will defend the Latter-day Saint faith out of a kind of tribal uh, defense of his own heritage. But 20, 30 minutes in, you realize, oh, the thing he's defending, he actually doesn't believe. And so you realize you just wasted your time. And it maybe got, you know, you were hashing something out that was completely irrelevant. Yes. So just because a Latter-day Saint is defending the positions of Mormonism doesn't mean they believe the positions. Sometimes it's a kind of def- a cultural defensiveness. It can be personal sometimes. The, where I start to see it as a game <clears throat> is where someone delights in that, when they treat it like an intellectual combat game, where they want to uh, tear down the beliefs of an evangelical. Um, but I, I, there's another... Um, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Daniel McClellan. I forget his. I forget. It. I might have mispronounced his name or misremembered his name. There's been Mormon scholars who will go into forums with Christians, and who know Hebrew really well, and <clears throat> will try to you know rip on Christians for what they believe about the Old Testament. And so they're coming from a Latter Day Saint sort of cultural position. And so what I've done is to say, look, I'll let you debate or dialogue in this context or something like that but I want you to first tell me what you believe. I want, to tell, I want you to tell us the, the, the thesis statement that you would rather us believe instead. I, I want you to give us the worldview out of which you're operating and put your cards on the table. If you're not willing to put your cards on the table, I think this is just a game to you and you're not really in this for truth's sake. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that's a big problem. It's. I would not, for a second, assume that by default of any Latter Day Saint that I'm talking to, but it becomes more of a problem when it comes to the, the the defenders, the advocates, the apologists, the intellectuals. Um, I, I'll give a few more examples. Sunstone used to be like this. Sunstone is a symposium held in downtown Salt Lake City, that in decades past was an interesting venue for discussing Mormon history, but it ended up just being a bunch of liberal atheist Mormons who don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus, who attend, who actively attend the LDS church. So I remember John DeLynn, who is very famous for Mormon stories. He used to be, I think, at the head of, Mormon, of uh, the Sunstone Foundation for like a year or two or maybe like that. Um, and I asked him at a Sunstone, a Sunstone Symposium, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? And he wouldn't give me a straight answer. And so I replied by saying, 
why are you defending Mormonism? Why, or why are you uh, representing yourself, at least in some superficial capacity, as a Mormon? Mormons believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Is this a historical cultural game to you? It's not to me. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but like, okay, I'll give you the last example. I, I get upset about this. I remember being on the street of Manti, talking for a week and a half with uh, lots of Latter-day Saints. Um, you know, probably a half dozen to a dozen conversations a night for a week and a half that were really substantive. And I remember uh, the, a, a club from BYU came down to Bantai of philosophy students. And I got into a discussion with some of them. And I started talking about a book called The Miracle of Forgiveness by Spencer W. Kimball. Spencer Kimball teaches how to be, to be forgiven for your sins. He teaches a repentance process that goes way beyond the biblical prerequisite for f- forgiveness and t- essentially teaches a form of perfectionism, puts a burdensome weight on the shoulders of Latter-day Saints. And I remember having the book and showing a passage to the BYU philosophy student, and he just smirked at the book and says, oh, that's, that's just Spencer Kimball. Like, that's just... And he looked at the crowd and he was, you know, it was like 14,000 chairs set aside for the pageant. He's like, they might believe it, but I don't. And I was like, you know, if Jesus looked at a, a crowd like this, he would say, this is, these are sheep without a shepherd. And he would have compassion on them. And he would look at what your leaders have taught your own people and the effect that it's had and how it's shaped and transformed their view of the gospel and forgiveness. And he would want to clarify that as much as he could. It's not a game to him, but he wanted it to just kind of spar. Like this is just like a, a game. And I mean, this isn't a game. I just got done spending a week and a half tr- trying as patiently as I could to share the gospel of forgiveness. And to some of these BYU guys, uh, it's just flexing intellectual muscles uh, and and if it's all if it's, if it's all a farce, then oh well, you know at least it's a good social structure where I have my friends and family and heritage. Don't rock the boat. It's all good. No worries. If if it's true, it's the most important thing in the world. But if it's not true, just leave us alone. No big deal. And that, and I think that's that's I think it's that's why I don't know that people. I think it, lots of Christians and I think, you know be careful, but because I, I think this would be true of me in many ways as well haven't really wrestled with the truth claims of the gospel in a way that makes it real to the extent of this, just to have the passion that goes along with that. And so I think that's why in some, some ways it's shocking for some people to see, you know, even someone like you has passion about this because it does matter. And we, you know, we, we have to be careful. I think certainly as apologists that, that it's not just, this is not just an intellectual game that we're playing, you know, where we're just trying to, to do the same thing because we're talking about either, you know, the reality of the gospel that's either true, you know, for everybody or it's true for nobody. C.S. Lewis said it can't be moderately important. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. All right. So let's, cause actually that, all right, so that'll take us into this one last thing I wanted to talk about. So in, in Kwaku's cross-examination, um, we've actually hit on most of what he had to say. We, we've mentioned a lot of the stuff in regards to, he talked about Calvin and Servatius again, and then he talked about, and that's when you were able to talk to him about, um, you know, throwing his, his apostles under the bus and how easy it is for us to throw Luther and Calvin on things that we disagree with them under the bus. But, um, and then that's where the idolatry uh, stuff came up. So, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we've already, we've already talked about came up, but uh, in your cross-examination of him, hmm. you mentioned first Corinthians 15. I thought this was really good. Um, so maybe we want to just kind of talk about this for a minute and then one, one or two other things. Um, but um, but essentially, so but maybe yeah, just want to share share with everybody what your what you were what you were attempting to do by by looking at the creed in First Corinthians fifteen. I tried to set this up by either before or after <clears throat> by having Quaku commit to the thick or the strong or robust definition of the great apostasy. So the thin or minimalist definition of the great apostasy might say something like, well, the early Christians had good intentions. They were good people. They loved Jesus. But there was simply a logistical problem. 
of getting the apostles together to pass down the priesthood authority. Whereas the robust definition would say, the fundamental principles of the gospel were lost. The church was obliterated. The kingdom of God was destroyed. And there were no true Christians on earth. That's a pretty maximal definition. And so I tried to give some quotes from LDS leaders and have Quaker commit to those. And he did. I don't think he understood what what the, what the significance was of him affirming those quotes. Because a lot of modern Latter-day Saint scholars in the BYU religion department, for example, would be very squeamish or very particular and, and you know, cautious not to fully affirm those quotes. But he, he Quaker was fine with it. So what I did is I went to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul says, these are the things of first importance that I delivered to you, that I also received. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then he goes on to talk about how Jesus appeared to Cephas and the 12 and the rest of the disciples, of many other disciples. And so for Paul, this is the core of the gospel. There's no priesthood authority. Because he says, he says in verse one there, I declare to you the gospel, which I preach to you. And then, then he goes on to define that by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. My premise is that if you have this gospel, and if you have believers believing this gospel, then you've got true believers. And if all you have to do is have these believers gather regularly, (laughs) and in some normative fashion, try to live out the instructions of the New Testament, then you've got yourself a local church, and you've got the kingdom of God. You've got... uh, plants that won't be, uh, uh, essentially the, uh, the essence of the plant that won't be uprooted. Um, but uh, so, so, Latter-day so, not, so not to interrupt, but you're saying, so if you had, if you had anybody during the 1800 years of the quote of the alleged great apostasy or whatever, anybody that's holding to this, this, the, to the creed in first Corinthians 15, then you, then there is no great apostasy. I, I might tweak that a little bit. I might say two or three. You, you mean two or three together? Mm-hmm. Two or three uh, together that gather, and then you've got yourself not just the invisible church, but you've got yourself a visible gathered church, and you've got the kingdom of God operating uh, at, at, at its essence as intended, um, and everything else is, is fleshing that out in the way God intends, but that's the essence right there. Is you've got, the essence is the gospel. The essence is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Those are the fundamental principles of the gospel. Um, by saying that the fundamental principles of the gospel were lost on earth, you've got to say that these teachings were lost from the earth, but they weren't. Uh, the gospel's still there. The gospel's powerful uh, by itself. It doesn't need priesthood authority and all the Mormon add-ons. Um, yeah. And and he and so so you you know so what we, you you quoted Joseph Fielding Smith who basically said yes that the fundamental principles of the gospel ceased during that time and then. Kwaku, I think, kind of hedged a little bit because then you asked them, okay, well, what are the fundamental principles of the gospel, right? So what, what, what are they um, that, 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 that ceased to exist during the Great Apostasy? And he kind of seemed like he hedged a little bit. Um, you know, he, he said, loving your neighbor is part of the gospel. I think, you know, one, you know something. But and he like said he, that principle was lost. Yeah, yeah, because you, you'd have to say all of those principles are lost, which is, you know, if there was a Great Apostasy. Um, or at least enough of them such that the essence of the kingdom of God and the church is lost. Which to yeah. your point, which is, okay, what would be beyond just, if, if there's something more to the gospel than what Paul is delivering in 1 Corinthians 15, then is Paul delivering an incomplete gospel, right? That's kind of your point. And if it is something, if that's, if that's the minimal gospel, then as long as people are gathering that are professing that, which we see this, you know, throughout the history, I mean, you can't deny that, then the, there was no great apostasy, right? That, I mean, that's kind of, the, that's the point that you're making. Yeah, the church, to properly function, according to the New Testament, should have things like elders, should have things like, you know, proper uh, administration of the ordinances. But um, at its essence, at its core, I think, you know, if you had a missionary go plant a church and he had two or three converts who believed in the essence of the gospel— and they gathered regularly, um, I, I think that would be sufficient evidence that the kingdom of God has not been obliterated from earth. Right. 
what what do you think of this? I know that so that I mean, you, you made well. Let's maybe one last point that in your. Um, that I'm you, good for time, so no worries. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you one last point that you made in the discussion was, um, you were trying to make the argument that the book of you you were asking him does the book of Mormon predict that the church would be taken from the earth and Quaku would you know he just kind of he wouldn't he wouldn't commit on it on that because. Um, he, he was trying to argue, well, the, the Book of Mormon is not a book about the earth. It was about, you know, a, a, a book about a small group of people. So we maybe just flesh that out a little. I mean, you're, it seems like you were trying to get him to admit that the Book of Mormon doesn't talk about that. But his point, his response was, well, it, it, we wouldn't expect it to because it was only talking about, you know, the, the, the small group of people that was sort of his, their history. Yeah. If I had to strategically do this over again, I think I would focus on the biblical proof texts that Mormons use to lend their hand to the great apostasy and respond to those. I went for a more historical um, issue here that it might've gone over people's heads. This is, this concerns how the early, the earliest ideas of what the great apostasy is in Mormonism did have, didn't have anything to do with priesthood authority. It had something more to do with the moral corruption and the general corruption of the church. It, it's not clear from the Book of Mormon, it's not very clear that the entire church would be completely obliterated. Uh, the Book of Mormon does seem to have its own consciousness of, of, of peoples beyond itself, um, but the earliest notions of the great apostasy in early Mormonism uh, seem pretty tame. They don't seem what like what came later so if if you see the Book of Mormon as restoring the you know something like the fullness of the gospel, um, surely you'd find Latter Day Saint distinctive theology in it. The problem is the Book of Mormon just doesn't teach that many interesting Mormon things. The Book of Mormon uh, is a, kind of a mishmash of of sloppy folk Protestant ish theology with some restorationist flavor. You know, sometimes it even sounds trinitarian, sometimes modalistic. But on the on on the things that most that make Mormonism most interesting and different, Mormonism Book of Mormon just doesn't teach those things. Uh, the Great Apostasy narrative was a later development, as it as it's explained today with with respect to priesthood authority. It's a late development. That was kind of my end goal was to show that the the priesthood authority definition of the Great Apostasy was not a part of the Book of Mormon. It wasn't a part of early Mormonism. The church supposedly was restored in 1830 without reference to the uh, Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthoods, without any consciousness on a part of some of the early founders of the restoration of the supposed restoration of the priesthood authority to Joseph Smith. Uh, in fact, when Joseph Smith later, ch he changes so he has these sections in a, in a book called the Book of Commandments, which later forms part of the basis of what's called the Doctrine and Covenants today. And he takes whole sections concerning the Restoration, which didn't make any mention to priesthood authority, and he literally just retrofits priesthood authority into the sections. Uh, if somebody's listening to this, you could Google, Google this. Joseph Smith changes revelations about priesthood authority. It's really famous cases of this. Not many lay Mormons know about it. But uh, the early witnesses of the Book of Mormon, some of them were pretty upset that Joseph Smith was introducing new ideas that they weren't, a, a, they weren't uh, privy to in the very beginning, yet, yet they're then later t taught as essential to the, to the uh, idea of great apostasy and restoration. So uh, this just isn't a part of the earliest framework of Mormonism. Uh, it's a later invention, uh, so do yeah. you think, I mean, I know that's somewhat, this is somewhat off topic, but building on that, do you think that it's dishonest for um, LDS missionaries or whoever, whoever, you know, to, to challenge me or whoever to read the Book of Mormon, you know, with, um, you know, and, and pray about it and, you know, God will reveal uh, the, the truth of, of the LDS church. But do you think it's dishonest for them to say, okay, read the Book of Mormon? Because if I want to really, if I really want to understand and I'm learning this, like you just said, if I'm, if I really want to understand LDS doctrine, I go to, I, I got to go to the, gospel doctrine, the cover, doctrine, yeah. to the gospel, yeah, to the gospel, doctrines and covenants, gospel principles, those kind of things, but not the book of Mormon. Do you think that that's in, 
you think it's intentionally dishonest or do you think it's just, yeah, I don't know what, what you're. So I don't think it's intellectually honest in the end. I don't think it's overtly malicious on the account of Mormon missionaries. I, but I think that when you take a step back and look at the system, what it's doing is it's doing a bait and switch. It's taking a lot of nominal Protestant Christians who have a little bit of familiarity with biblical language and biblical categories, and their missionaries have them read the Book of Mormon, which sounds spiritual because it's got that Elizabethan, Jacobian, King James biblical feel to it, and it sounds biblical because it essentially borrows a lot of biblical categories of theology and doesn't seem to overtly, uh, you know, uh, radically reinvent Christianity like later Mormonism does. So what it does is it draws people in and they're encouraged to have a, a kind of emotional, spiritual experience. But it's important to understand that I think even from the very beginning of Mormonism, it really wasn't the content of the Book of Mormon that converted people to Mormonism. It was the existence of the Book of Mormon. It was like, oh, there's this uh, added book with a new with the prophet who can add other things. And so when people get a testimony of the Book of Mormon, they're not really getting a testimony of the originally or, original intended meaning of a historical grammatical reading of the Protestant it, Protestant-ish theology of the Book of Mormon. They're just getting a testimony, as it were, of a an emotional epiphany affirmation that this book is inspired of God, even if I don't understand the content very well. And it's from that testimony or, or, or sense that it's inspired of God that they then jump to what modern Latter-day Saint teachers have extrapolated and developed. And, and what happens is, it's a bait and switch because um, they're asked, you know, the Book of Mormon teaches in Moroni 8, 18, that God is unchangeable from all eternity to all eternity. And in the King Follett Discourse, one of Joseph Smith's last sermons, he says, quote, we have imagined and supposed that God was God from all eternity. I will refute that idea and take away the veil so that you may see. God was once a man as we are now, and we have got to learn how to be gods, the same as all the gods have done before us. So the Book of Mormon not only does it really not have Mormon content in it, it has teachings in it that in order to be a faithful Mormon, you have to reject. Uh, if, if the Book of Mormon is true, Mormonism is false because it teaches Protestant-ish 1830 theology that Mormonism has radically rejected. So to, to hold the Book of Mormon out as theologically representative of modern Mormonism is in the end, when you take a step back and look at the whole system, is very dishonest. I would not accuse an individual Latter-day Saint, you know, missionary of, of overt, you know, uh, deception with respect to that, especially an 18-year-old kid who just got sent out. But uh, yeah, yeah, but yeah. they're just playing the script. That they're just going down the script that they were taught, and that's what in this. And the leaders are the ones that are pushing yes. or, or teaching them on that. Yeah. Um, all right, one last question. This came up actually in a book I was uh, reading, um, Chip Thompson, The Mormon Scrapbook. Um, so one of, the, one of the ways that he talks about the, uh, the way to, to answer the, the question of the great apostasy is um, that, the, that the Book of Mormon actually teaches that in uh, Third Nephi, so I'm interested for your take on this and maybe yeah, to see what you think about this, that uh, in Third Nephi, the, um, the Book of Mormon actually teaches that uh, John and then three of the Nephites from, um, that th three of the Nephites uh, actually never died, plus the Apostle John. So if that's true, uh, Thompson's uh, position is, well, then there could never have been a great apostasy because part of the, the requirements of the great apostasy is all of the apostles were gone and there was no one who was, you know, that was still teaching um, correct theology and then I, you know, had the keys to the priesthood and, and taught priesthood authority and those kind of things. But if they were still alive, then that kind of negates that. So uh, I don't know, thoughts on that or do you? Yeah, it's, it's with John and the three Nephites who evidently have priesthood authority and evidently are able to administer this priesthood authority or ordain others with this priesthood authority and they're on earth. So what's the deal? Like why, it, it just seems like if the preservation of the church is so important, I mean, the, the American military has people who have access to the nuclear codes when things get really bad. Why can't you, can't, why can't you send the three Nephites or John to administer the proper priesthood authority 
uh, ordinances to to uh, perpetuate this precious bride of Christ church uh, if it's really going to die. Um, and uh, yeah, I think it's a completely valid argument. I, there's a there's a video I have on my YouTube channel called "Did a Great Apostasy and Restoration Really Happen?" It's a lecture by Marv Cowan, and he for 50 minutes gives a very uh, developed argument against the, the great apostasy, and he goes into some detail about this particular argument um, with details that make it more robust. I think it's a completely valid argument. Um, I, I would caution uh, Latter-day, I would caution Christians from going to completely valid arguments like this too quickly if you have more straightforward biblical arguments available to you. Um, I think that, uh, again, it's a completely valid uh, argument, and you might have the, a particular kind of conversation where you think it's really helpful to bring up this argument. Uh, it's just that uh, the, uh, the vantage point out of which I want to debunk Mormonism is the authority of the words of Jesus and the authority of the New Testament. I'm really trying to use the Bible and the gospel um, and the Christian worldview as the seed that when planted, ultimately, it, it's the chief thing that debunks Mormonism because I'm trying to give them the gospel. I'm trying to give them the uh, contrasting biblical truth that they should put their trust in. And um, so anyway, I don't want to disparage valid arguments like this though, because God uses them and they're completely, they're true. So, uh, you know, whatever seems wise and strategic to you, but we have uh, one, sorry, we have um, in, it's called, been called countercult material or, or literature, uh, evangelicals that have been trying to reach Mormons for like 150 years here. Uh, we have a long tradition of refuting the great apostasy, but I don't think we've tapped into the Matthew 13 kingdom growth parables like we could have. I think that we should renew our interest in them, uh, one, because Jesus taught them, and two, because Joseph Smith overtly reinterprets every single one of them. I, I would just encourage Christians that there's a whole lot more in the New Testament available to us to, do, to uh, interact with all the touch points of Mormonism than we think there is. And I think that goes to your point that you were talking about last week, which is your goal is not just to disabuse a you know, Mormon of their Mormonism and becoming an atheist, an angry atheist, right? We want, we want to see people come to a saving knowledge of the true Jesus. And so um, anytime you can get people into the biblical text, it's good. And let the, let the, let the word do what the word does. Um, so your, your, your goal is twofold there. You're, you're trying to show that the great apostles didn't happen, but you're also trying to get people into the new Testament um, and get them in, introducing them to the person of Jesus in the gospels. Thanks for our time together. I know I've monologued a lot on this, uh, this one, but thanks for the opportunity. Yeah, man. So that was, that was good. Um, all right. Well, we will, uh, we will come back for one more next week as we'll look at the question of uh, our families forever. And uh, so we'll talk about um, your and Kwaku's uh, interaction then. Uh, thanks for being on the show. Certainly loved uh, having you. And this has been great. Uh, I enjoy just doing this because I'm learning uh, from you. So, uh, so thanks for uh, joining us and thanks, uh, we sir. will talk to you soon.